Good morning. I don't know if am I on. Good morning, and welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. Delighted to welcome you uh, this morning to uh, the next in our series. Uh, I have a couple of uh, announcements to begin with, and then I'm going to let Mason introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Long is going to be here uh, for various things during the day. After this talk, we'll go over to the Tadlock House. We'll have coffee and donuts if you want to come over and chat with her and have a Blackbird donut and some coffee. Come and join us afterwards at Tadlock. This evening, she'll speak again at 7 o'clock at First Presbyterian Church. That'll be in the Fellowship Hall at First Pres at 7. Um, in two weeks, we have our next event, which is going to be Ann Bailey. Um, Ann is a historian at the University, uh, State University of New York in Binghamton, and she has a book called The Weeping Time about the largest slave auction in American history. And she's going to come address, uh, address us on that on November 4th. In the meantime, though, we also have our student lecture coming up. Uh, student lecture is going to be October 28th. Next Monday, this will be Jaron Puckett, voted on by faculty, and she's going to come talk about the Apollo 1 space program. So please join us for those events, and I'll now turn it over. And also, let me issue a welcome. Any of you who are visiting today, thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Uh, come say hello at the end of the event. Come have a donut with us. We're glad you're with us this morning. I'll turn it over to Mason. Dr. Catherine Long is an alum of the University of Missouri, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and Duke University, where she received a PhD in History of American Christianity. Dr. Long is particularly interested in Christianity in the Americas in the 19th and 20th centuries. She enjoys studying how historical memory is shaped by communities and cultural interpretation. Dr. Long is passionate about good writing and sees writing and historical research as inherently Christian activities. Dr. Long is, is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church and is also an associate a professor emerita at Wheaton College in Illinois, but has retired to Indiana. Dr. Long is the author of several books on the history and present status of Christianity in the Americas, and she is especially interested in the Christian mission to the Wairani people of Amazonian Ecuador. Published this year by Oxford University Press, her book, God in the Rainforest, traces the formation of the evangelical mission to the Wairani people. The book traces how the mission came to be one of the most celebrated by evangelicals and most criticized by anthropologists and critics who accused the missionaries of destroying the indigenous culture. Dr. Long is sure to give agency to indigenous voices, which is particularly difficult as the Wairani historically had no written language. In the book, Dr. Long studies the complexities of Christianity for missionaries, anthropologists, environment, environmentalists, and indigenous peoples. Dr. Long brings these seemingly competing agendas together to highlight the experiences of one indigenous people in the midst of globalization. Today, we welcome Dr. Long's sister, Jan Davis, as well as Carol Starnes, the niece of King alum Catherine Peake, of whom Long will be speaking today. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Catherine Long. Thank you. just want to say thanks very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here this morning and appreciate the opportunity to see your beautiful campus and um, see all of you out here looking reasonably awake. I know that uh, I, I've heard that the world is divided into two types of people. The people who say, good morning, Lord, and the people who say, good Lord, morning. And uh, I fall in the latter category, so I can sympathize if you're there too. started here. Years ago, Richard Mao, then president of Fuller Theological Seminary, wrote a small book titled Consulting the Faithful, What Christian Intellectuals Can Learn from Popular Religion. In it, Mao talks of participating in a discussion with a Catholic theologian on the subject of praying to the saints. It was, Mao reported, a good discussion, friendly all around, although not, neither of us changed any minds. Afterwards, a Catholic parish preach, a pro priest approached Mao and somewhat jokingly accused him of having too many scruples about praying to the saints. 
The saints helped me out a lot in my ministry, the priest said with a smile, <clears throat> and went on to tell Mao about a parishioner who had recently come to him. The man did not get along with his mother-in-law, and Thanksgiving, the whole family was together, was especially a difficult time. We always fight, he told the priest. What can I do to get along with her for a few hours? When you walk into her home, the priest responded, give her a big hug. As you get ready to do so, pray this prayer to St. Francis. St. Francis, you hugged the leper, even though you found him dirty and ugly. You were able to do it because you knew that Jesus loved the leper. Help me to hug my mother-in-law and show her a little bit of the love of Jesus. <laughs> it worked. After Thanksgiving, the man reported he'd hugged his mother-in-law while praying to St. Francis. He imagined her as a leper whom Jesus loved, and he found it a little easier for him to love her as well. You Protestants need saints too, the priest told Mao. You have plenty of people who need to learn how to hug their mothers-in-law. Now, I'm not singling out mothers-in-law in this thing. I think in today's polarized world, there's lots of people that need to learn how to hug all sorts of other people. The priest did not convince Rich Mao, an evangelical from the Reformed side of the theological spectrum, to pray to St. Francis. But the incident did cause him to reflect on a few Protestant saints, and I say saints with a small s, whose stories had influenced his life. One was the Dutch Christian Corey Ten Boom, whose book The Hiding Place tells how our family risk everything, including their lives, to side with Jews in the face of Nazi evils during World War II. I never try to talk to her or others directly, Mao wrote, but I do try to stay connected to their stories. Every other year or so, he continued, I, read, I reread The Hiding Place. Corey Ten Boom's courage inspires me. I try to think of ways in which I can show similar courage in my own life. Our calling is to follow Jesus and to seek to become more like him. However, the Bible also indicates that one way we can become more like Christ is by remembering and imitating the holy lives of faithful believers, both those on earth and those in heaven. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. That's what Richard Mount meant when he talked about staying in touch with Corey Ten Boom and seeking to imitate her faith and courage. When I think about evangelical saints that I would like to stay in touch with, one who comes to mind was an unassuming introverted linguist named Catherine Peake. She was born in 1924 and died in 2014. She was an alumna at King University, King University, and in 2001 the university named its School of Mission after her, Missions after her. While many of you may be familiar with her name, you may not know much about her story. I hope to fill that gap uh, this morning and, and tonight by considering the virtues of holiness and creativity as reflected in Dr. Peake's life and the role she as a Bible translator played in the relationship between faith and culture among the Waurani people of the Ecuadorian Amazon. But first, a little background on Catherine Peake. Catherine was born in Weaverville, North Carolina, the youngest of six children. The Peake home was not particularly religious until her mother was converted when Catherine was 13. Catherine, too, soon responded to the gospel, followed by most of the rest of the family. Peake hoped to serve the church as a missionary, and she was fascinated by languages. As a high school student, when it came time to choose classes, Catherine picked Latin on the hunch that it would be easier for her than home economics. And I think the rest of her life bore that out. She, could, she couldn't boil an egg, but she, could, she was great at languages. During her college years, Peake studied first at Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University, and then at King College, now King University. However, when she graduated from King in 1947, she discovered that the options for single women missionaries were pretty limited in mainline denominations, uh, limited to child evangelism, nursing, or secretarial work. None of these matched the quiet young woman's gifts, so the Presbyterian Mission Board, bless their hearts, suggested that Peake apply to work with the fledgling Wycliffe Bible translators. She was accepted by Wycliffe in 1949. Her first assignment was to Peru, but a few, a few years later, Peake was asked to help begin the work of the Summer Institute of Linguistics in Ecuador. And let me just clarify, I'll be using a lot the, the term SIL, Summer Institute of Linguistics, which is essentially the Wycliffe Bible Translators Abroad. I mean, there's lots of other things, but for our pur purposes. Wycliffe Bible Translators is the group here in the US. Summer Institute of Linguistics is what they, how they identify themselves in other countries because it emphasizes more of the scientific nature of linguistics that they're trying to, trying to do. Um, anyway, she arrived in Ecuador in 1953, and, and Peake and a colleague named Mary Sargent first attempted translation work in the Zaporo language. 1955, while still looking for people who spoke Zaporo, Peake accompanied another SIL colleague, Rachel Saint, during several months that Saint spit, spent in a hacienda on the edge of the rainforest. She was trying to establish a relationship with a young woman named Dayuma, who was from the Waurani people, at the time an isolated and mysterious Amazonian tribe. 
When Catherine and Rachel were with Dayuma on the hacienda, there were approximately 500 Waurani living scattered across an area about the size of Connecticut. Their traditional territory was part of what Ecuadorians referred to as the Oriente, which is the eastern uh, third, actually, probably about of their country, east of the Andes Mountains. Moving frequently and living in small clearings, the Waurani were hard for outsiders to find. Most didn't want to since the Indians defended their territory with 10 foot long spears. And I just realized I haven't been telling my friendly person here to change slides so you haven't gotten any of the visuals. Let's just kind of catch up with ourselves here. Okay, there's, there's uh, Catherine as she would have been about at graduation time from, from uh, King and then Catherine on her last trip to uh, Ecuador with a Waurani, young Waurani woman. And this is the, this is Wau territory here. You can just wait a second. And uh, it, it, the river to the north uh, is the, uh, is the Napo River and the river to the south is the Kurai. And it's kind of in between. And this is the, the, the forest. You can just hold on to this. Thing. That's the, uh, it gives you some sense of the density of the rainforest. If you've got 500 people, an area the, the size of the state of Connecticut, they can hide pretty easily. Um, let's see what the next one is. Okay, stop here. So, um, no outsiders. Mo well, moving frequently and living in small clearings, the Waurani were hard for outsiders to find. Most didn't want to since the Indians defended their territory with 10 foot long spears. And uh, if you want to see what Waurani spear, we'll have a couple tonight at the church. We decided we'd not try to wrestle them in this morning, but uh, no outsiders, including missionaries, had ever been able to have sustained peaceful contact with the Waurani. Most people in Ecuador called them Aucas, a word from the Quechua language meaning savage or uncivilized. Even today, the Waurani consider Auca a pejorative word. They were offended for years when a lot of Christians kept using the word Auca, and they're really Waurani. For their part, however, the Waurani described everyone who was not Waurani as a Kowodi, and the Kowodi meant a subhuman cannibal, so they weren't exactly nice to the other side either. A subhuman cannibal who should, who should be shot, or should be killed, excuse me, they weren't shooting, should be killed. Waurani violence was not only directed towards Kowodi, but also towards one another. About two-thirds of their spearings were revenge killings, Waurani killing other Waurani. When the Summer Institute decided there were not enough Sapporo speakers to make a translation project feasible, Peak became the linguistic consultant for SIL in Ecuador. About the same time, Rachel Saint's brother, Nate, a pilot with Mission Aviation Fellowship and four friends, Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, Ed McCauley, and Roger Udarian, all young missionaries working among indigenous groups in Amazonian Ecuador, were developing a plan of their own to make peaceful contact with the Waurani, a project that later came to be known as Operation Auca. Despite meticulous planning, fervent prayer, and an initial friendly encounter, Operation Auca came to a tragic end on Sunday, January 8, 1956, when six spear-wielding Waurani attacked the five men and killed them all. This uh, is the picture of all five of them. The uh, three on top are what they call the Brethren Boys. Uh, Ed, Ed McCauley, Peter Fleming, and Jim Elliott. And to the left there is Roger Udarian. And at the bottom is the pilot, Nate Saint. We go to the next one. And this is recovering the bodies after they were, after they were killed. Go on, next one. Despite, um, Let's see, two years later, the story had an unexpected sequel. Two missionary women, Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of one of the slain men, and Rachel Saint, the sister of the other, of another, with the help of the Wau woman, Dayuma, successfully contacted the Waurani and began efforts to introduce them to Christianity and to help end the violence that was destroying their culture. The sacrificial deaths of the five men and subsequent efforts to Christianize the Waurani became the defining missionary martyr narrative for American evangelicals during the second half of the 20th century. It certainly was the most widely publicized. Uh, there are generations of evangelicals, probably my generation, maybe a couple older than you guys, um, who, who everyone knew this story. And um, through Gates of Splendor, that's the main way people tend to tended to know it. Through Gates of Splendor, Elizabeth Elliot's inspirational account of the five men became an immediate bestseller. Almost 50 years later, in 2006, Christianity Today magazine ranked the book as number nine in a list of the 50 most important books published since World War II that helped, had shaped American evangelicalism. Catherine Peake was on furlough in North Carolina when the men were killed. She remembered being horrified by their deaths. She had known four of the five quite well. She particularly mourned the loss of Jim Elliot and Peter Fleming, both gifted linguists. 
Their deaths were not only a loss for the Quechua, among whom they were working at the time they were killed, uh, but also for the Waurani. If they had been able to establish a peaceful contact with the Waurani, then Pete and Jim would have been the logical people to learn the Wau language to translate the New Testament. The five men had a secure place in evangelical memory as martyrs and missionary heroes. The women who followed them, and Dayumo too, but the women who followed them, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint, were viewed as larger than life figures because they had done what the men couldn't do and they were two women uh, with a small child, uh, the Elliot's small daughter. Dayuma too came to represent the, the ideal wow Christian. And, um, and so these, all of these people were kind of larger than life mythical people. And yet uh, it was against this backdrop that Catherine Peake came, was working in Ecuador. Both Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot were fiercely independent and a little, not a little, more than a little competitive in their efforts to learn wow today though. By the way, wow is the short form of waurani. So I'm not saying wow, I'm saying wow. But sometimes because of that, you say use word anymore. But um, <clears throat> they, the two of them were trying to learn to speak the language, which is no easy task, as we'll see. Um, Elizabeth had an ear for languages, which made her a better speaker and translator than Rachel. While Elizabeth clearly enjoyed the academic side of language acquisition, Rachel did not. Her main concern was with evangelism, and she struggled with Bible translation. Rachel was highly motivated to speak the language, however imperfectly, in order to share the gospel with the Waurani. During this time, Catherine Peake continued as a language consultant, helping SIL staff with their translation work. She remained on the periphery of the missionary Waurani story. In 1960, Peake spent a weekend in Tuaino, consulting with Rachel Saint on Saint's translation efforts. Peake knew that Saint and Elliot found it hard to work together. Among other things, their strong personalities and the different perspectives each had on what it meant to be a missionary clouded their relationship. Because she and Rachel were unable to collaborate, Elizabeth decided to leave the Waurani mission in late 1961. Before she did, she offered her copious language notes to Catherine Peake, who spent three weeks in Tuano copying them. For Peake, they were a treasure trove of potential research materials. The gift also reflected Elliot's awareness that, with, that Catherine was the most qualified person to left to work on WOW today, though, in Bible translation. Because if Elizabeth left, Pete and Jim were dead. Uh, they were getting a little sparse there. SIL administrators hoped that Peake would join Saint full-time in Tewaino. Peake herself was interested in other possible callings. Either she wanted to work with a different tribe in Ecuador, or she was pursuing a PhD, she wanted to pursue a PhD in anthropological linguistics. She chose, chose the PhD and was accepted at Indiana University. Her dissertation topic, however, kept her connected to Rachel and to the Waurani. It was analysis and technical grammar of the Wau language. In other words, Catherine Peake Pig figured out the structure of this language that had not been written down, that no one um, knew anything about at that particular point in time. Uh, in doing so, she spent uh, several months each year uh, with the Waurani uh, to, in, this, in a little town called Tueno, or a town village clearing place called Tueno that was a Waurani community where missionaries usually went to stay. Wangi, Pete's Waurani, uh, Peak's Waurani name, became a familiar figure to the original inhabitants of Tueno. Rachel Saint remained among the Waurani after Elizabeth Elliot left. She would be the only permanent missionary in Wau territory between 1961 and 1969. Her greatest contribution during those years as a peacemaker was as a peacemaker among the Waurani. She kept reminding them that the, that the gospel message was a message of peace, the, the kind of basic four spiritual laws message for the Waurani was not that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, it's in the name of Jesus do not spear. It's kind of stop spearing, that was a sign that you were a Christian. So the bar was fairly low. Um, <clears throat> but um, so, so Rachel, Rachel was reinforcing this ideal about, about Jesus and peace. Additionally, she provided basic health care. However, there was a downside to Saint's work. In part, she had no SIL co-worker because she refused to accept any other missionary or linguistic colleague on a permanent basis, insisting that Dayume was the person God had chosen to be her quote-unquote partner in Bible translation. Rachel also was slow in completing what was supposed to be her primary tasks, Bible translations and literacy work. During the 18 years, she was assigned by the Summer Institute to do translation among the Waurani from about 1958 to now about 1976. Mark's Gospel and a rough draft of the Book of Acts were the only portions of the New Testament that she and Dayume translated. 
Linguist Catherine Peake and Rosie Jung would pick up the translation work in 1979 and complete the New Testament in about 10 years. Peake received her PhD in June 1968 and by July was back in Ecuador. At that time, she was officially assigned to work among the Waurani. However, because a large group of unconverted Waurani had recently arrived in Tueno, Rachel Saint was concerned for Peake's safety. As a result, she remained outside the community before she finally got to move to Tueno in mid-1970. So from mid-1970 on, Tueno, this little village, was Catherine's uh, home among the Waurani. Despite having her PhD in hand, during the 1970s, Catherine backed away from translation work to avoid conflicts with Rachel. Uh, instead, she helped four other SIL staff members assigned to work among the Waurani settle in and begin to learning to speak the language. During the 1980s, after Rachel had retired, Catherine and Rosie Jung, a German uh, SIL person, and their WOW language assistants, assistants translated the New Testament. It was published in May 1992 and dedicated in June. Rosie returned to Germany to work at the German branch after it was, uh, after it was dedicated to work at the German branch of the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Catherine retired in North Carolina. However, they made three-month trips to Ecuador in 1993 and 1994, and shorter trips in later years. Uh, to teach the Waurani how to read the Bible and understand the New Testament, Catherine's home in retirement was a place where her roots were the deepest, the family farmhouse in Weaverville. She shared the house with her sister Elizabeth, Libba, herself a retired missionary to Haiti. Go, next one. That's Dayuma. Uh, she was on the house. Okay, next one. Oh, there's Catherine's, Catherine's dissertation. You can see the this, this structure, trying to sort out the structure of the language there, at the, the drawing on the diagram on the... Uh, Left, then next. Catherine speaking to a couple of wow men, probably about that time, maybe a little bit later. And next one. This is the this is a little house in Tueno. I don't think it's the actual house that Rosie and Catherine lived in. Well, they lived in a number of houses, but uh, this was one, maybe it, it might have been the last one. It was in the location where their house was. And I was there with, with a friend and people told us it was Rosie and um, Catherine's, but it was in too good a shape because they hadn't been there for like five years. So, uh, but anyway, this, is, this gives you an idea of the place they would have, uh, would have lived in, the type of place they would have lived in uh, Tueno. There they are headed for Tueno. Uh -huh. And then as you come into Tueno, that's the airstrip. So you can see it's about the size of a couple football fields maybe. And it's pretty, pretty slight, but the mission aviation pilots are quite good. So, uh, so I always wanted to fly with them. <laughs> but, uh, and then there they are with, the, with their translations of the, uh, of the New Testament once they finally got it finished. This was just kind of a quick recap and then I'll double back and talk a little bit more about some of these. This is the Peak home in uh, Weaverville. This farmhouse is where I first met Catherine Peak on July 3rd, 2000. I was in the initial stages of writing a book about missionaries that some people called the Alka Martyrs. I was interested in why this particular story became a defining narrative for post-war American evangelicals. In June 2000, I was doing research at the Towns and Archives in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Uh, and these had uh, archives with papers and, and letters from the founder of the Wycliffe Bible Translators, a man named Cameron Townsend. Uh, as I was reading uh, about, reading Townsend's letters and so on, I kept coming across Catherine Peake's name. And I don't know if I'd ever heard it before, but I certainly saw it in these, in these archives. The archivist, an 80-year-old man named Cal Hibbard, who had been uh, Mr. Townsend's secretary, told me that Catherine was someone I definitely needed to talk to. And even while he was telling me this, he walked over to the phone, picked up, dialed the number, handed it to me, said, here she is. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> That's sort of when you know something's providential. But um, Dr. Peake, as I called her at the time, agreed to the interview, which lasted about an hour and a half. It was helpful, but even more important, I was able to make contact with Dr. Peake and to lay the groundwork for uh, a relationship with her. My second visit to Weaverville was not quite five years later in March 2005, although we had, we had exchanged a lot of emails between then. I was on sabbatical from teaching at Wheaton College and trying to devote more time to my book. Uh, by this time, I realized that the story of missionaries in the Waurani was much more complicated than I'd originally thought. I also decided I would use primary sources, letters, reports, um, uh, interviews, things like that, to write a history that didn't depend on books already published. And I was pretty sure that Catherine Peake had many of the primary sources, especially letters, that I wanted. And so I wanted to visit her home and, steal those and, and, and see those letters. 
Catherine uh, had, a re had a reputation as a writer and not as a talker. And so as a result, the people, the other people, other Summer Institute of Linguistics people working among the Guarani delegated all the writing to her. Somebody wrote, wrote them letters and asked, well, how are the quote unquote Alcas doing? How's this going on? She was always the one that got delegated to respond, which meant that her papers had a lot of the important, uh, important I lose no, no, right. And, and Catherine also maintained an extensive private correspondence. She was of the generation where people wrote a letter home every week. Uh, I know my father wrote a letter to his mother every Sunday night. Catherine did something very similar to her family. And, and they kept all those letters and she kept copies of them. Now one thing I didn't learn in graduate school was how you contact people that you don't know very well, people you plan to write about, and ask if you can come and spend a week going through their papers. <laughs> Catherine Peake was not too keen on the idea at first. Since I first met her, we'd exchanged numerous emails. In the previous summer, I'd done some research at the Summer Institute of Linguistics headquarters in Dallas, Texas. And that was a point in my favor, because they didn't usually let people do that. And so if they let me in, Catherine thought maybe I'd be OK. And I begged. And in the end, her innate kindness won the day, and she allowed me to come. Of course, I told her I'd stay in a nearby motel and provide for my own meals. But there wasn't any place to stay near Weaverville, Catherine informed me. She invited me to stay with her and explained that some of her earlier hesitancy by telling me that her sister Libba, whom I had met, was struggling with Alzheimer's disease but still living at home and Catherine was caring for her. She didn't know if that would bother me and I said, no. I assured her it would not. So I arrived at the farmhouse a few days after Easter in 2005 and I soon discovered the upstairs rooms were filled with Catherine's books and papers. Catherine was this careful linguist and scholar, but she wasn't the most organized person, a trait I could identify with. I spent five days going through boxes, file cabinets, and drawers, taking notes as rapidly as I could. Misty Kitty, Catherine's cat, was usually stretched out somewhere nearby, keeping an eye on me. One after, when one afternoon, Catherine somewhat apologetically asked if I would stay with Elizabeth while she ran some errands for an hour. I said yes, and so everything was quiet for the first 30 minutes or so. It was a chilly, early spring day, and I looked up from my reading and suddenly realized that Elizabeth was cranking up the thermostats throughout the house. As high, as high as they would go. I tried to distract her and turn the thermostats back down again, but she wasn't fooled. Miss Elizabeth, I'd say, why don't we just wait for your sister before we turn the heat up? Mercifully, after about 10 minutes of the two of us playing thermostat tag, Catherine returned home. As the week went on, Catherine answered my questions, explained genealogy charts she'd done of Wairani families, and showed me her language notes. But in true peak fashion, we didn't talk very much. Um, on several occasions, on several occasions, especially when I came across letters or reports that dealt with sensitive or controversial issues, we talked about what's appropriate to include in a book like this. Catherine felt that the SIL staff who had worked with Waurani had already faced more than their share of criticism. I argued that for the book to have credibility, I had to be able to write about the negative as well as the positives of the mission. Catherine took my points seriously and by the end of the week was much more open to the project than she had been. Catherine had the sensibilities of both the scholar and the missionary that she was. During the next three years, I exchanged regular emails with Dr. Peek. She read a review I wrote of the film, The End of the Spear, and with her eye for proofreading, caught a mistake that would have been very embarrassing to me. I won't tell you what it was. In, uh, in 2008, I received an email from Catherine saying she was downsizing. Apart from a few things that she might give to colleag colleagues, she was cleaning out her, the house, and the bulk of her papers would probably end up being tossed in a ditch somewhere. As a historian, that's like, no. And so uh, I told Catherine not to throw anything out and then contacted the Billy Graham Center archives at Wheaton College and asked if they would be willing to give the Peak Papers a temporary or if needed a permanent home. The answer was yes and my sister Jan and I made a quick trip to North Carolina to collect Catherine's papers. It was wonderful to see her again, although difficult to see her beginning to struggle with short-term memory loss. Her papers were housed in the Graham Center for 10 years with the stipulation that I could use them as long as I needed to and I did. When my book was ready for publication, Catherine Papers was sent to the Language and Culture Art Archives of SIL International as she had wished. Shortly after my sister and I returned with Catherine's papers, I received an email from her. She ruefully noted that she'd found two more boxes of papers. Maybe she suggested we could return at some point and get those too. Unfortunately, it was not to be, although I stayed in touch with Catherine for the next year. Uh, in 2010, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and dealing with the disease initially felt overwhelming and coupled with my work responsibilities meant that my correspondence with Catherine had ended. Even so, I read and reread Catherine's papers and I felt like I continued to get to know her even after her death in 2014. 
My admiration for her as a linguist, a missionary, and a Protestant saint who sought to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ continued to grow. When I think of the characteristics of Dr. Peake's life that I'd like to stay in touch with, I, one, would, one would be her sense of identity, both as a child of God and as a child of a particular family, culture, and time. Also, because of her reserved personality, she found identity in community. She was part of a community of believers who supported her in her calling as a Bible translator. These people included her church, Weaverville Presbyterian, the community she later found with the Wycliffe Bible Translators and Summer Institute of Linguistics. Um, and the Wycliffe Bible Translators was an organization that's known by historians and others as a faith mission, which means that people who join the Wycliffe Bible Translators have to raise their own support, raise money to pay their salaries. And um, in Catherine's case, the Weaverville Presbyterian Church was eager to help. This session, the governing body of the church had an opportunity to provide, had had an opportunity to provide a support for another young woman who was going as a nurse to the Congo. And for some reason, the session had decided not to do it. And afterwards, they felt guilty um, because they thought maybe they made a mistake. So then they, they voted that they would, um, they would fund the next person who called to the mission field. Catherine was next. And uh, little did the church know they support Catherine's ministry for 51 years. So that was, that was definitely, definitely a commitment. Along with her identity as a Christian, a missionary, and a linguist, Catherine was proud to be a descendant of families that founded the town of Weaverville, North Carolina. She appreciated God's gift of particularity. He, she had shaped her, her identity, identity by making her the child of a specific family born at a particular point in time, in a specific place. She cherished the North Carolina mountains, the family homestead, and a way of speaking she sometimes referred to as my hillbilly accent. Nearly all the months and years she lived in Ecuador, she wrote a letter home every week, as I said. Catherine Peake knew who she was. Paradoxically, that gave her freedom to relate effectively to people as different from her as the Waurani were. As part of her devotional life, she sometimes wrote poetry. The poems weren't always the strongest literary pieces, but they clearly came from her heart. And I have one here, I'm gonna go really quickly to reflect her sense of self. Let's see if we can catch up here again. Yeah, there it is. Um, if you can see it, otherwise I'll just read it. And she, she writes, my letter home each week is my touch with the reality of who I am as a human being. That reality which is almost my right to be. It links the shy country child that was to a specialized linguist served by a bevy of great people who are bent on seeing the uncommon gift of linguistic insight bear fruit in a scripture translation. Too easily distracted, I need that help to keep me oriented towards the goal. Similarly, my daily prayer is my touch with who I am as a child of God. The reality which is in fact my right to be links the child who I am with the new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm served by a body of believers intent on seeing the treasures that I have in Jesus Christ. Go to the next, yeah. That I have in Jesus Christ. Bear fruit to his glory. Oddly, no miraculously, the goals of the two sides of my nature blend into one, and here is peace. The word of God in another tongue. Glory, glory, glory. As I've kept in touch with Dr. Peake, I'm also challenged by the way she trusted God, and a trust that's foundational for a true life of virtue and holiness. She trusted God for protection. Catherine was renowned among other SIL people for her, her ability to sleep soundly at night in the rainforest. Once she fell asleep, it was almost impossible to wake her up. This much to the dismay of her colleague, Rosie Jung, who was not a heavy sleeper, she was a light sleeper. And uh, Rosie heard everything. The jungle at night was not a quiet place. Pig decides some, describes some of the sounds in a one letter home. She wrote, the frogs are chanting in chorus, the katydids and crickets are chirping, the whippoorwills singing in the moonlight, and in the background the Waurani are chanting at an honest fiesta right across the river. Oh yes, and the occasional scorpion. I was amazed to learn that one bell-like tone is made by the big scorpion. I'm like, really? Except for her reference to the occasional scorpion and the big scorpion, Catherine's description of the rainforest at night was an idyllic one. Yet missionaries who lived, lived among the Waurani in Tewano knew that the nighttime hours had not been always so peaceful. Between 1900 and 1958, the Waurani were engaged in a violent internal feud. Nighttime, especially moonless nights, was a favorite time for one group of Waurani to stage a surprise attack on the other. One reason the Waurani sang at night or chanted was to uh, let enemies know that people in the clearing were awake, so you, couldn't, you weren't going to be able to mount a surprise attack on them. During this period of intense feuds, approximately 60% of all Waurani deaths were violent ones. So of all the Waurani who died during this half, 60% died violent deaths. And another, another, I don't know, five or 10% died from snake bite. So a lot of things kind of getting in the way of longevity. Um, among those who had participated in the killing were the people who lived in Tueno. Um, 
And when Catherine first visited them in 1959, less than a year after that, it was less than a year after they had decided to lay down their spears. So she was coming, these people had been fighting for at least a half century, 60 or 70 years, perhaps more. A year later, she shows up to see that they've pledged to be peaceful. Then, and for many years to come, Rachel Saint insisted that female missionaries or other foreign women staying with the Wow Clearing have a fleeing can ready at all times. A fleeing can was a coffee can with a flashlight, matches, candles, and other things Rachel thought might be helpful if they were attacked at night and had to flee into the jungle. Catherine was not impressed. She's going, we're attacked by night. This, uh, that's going to be all she wrote. <laughs> well, a fleeing can's probably not going to do much good, but she had one. But the remarkable aspect of her letters, Catherine's letters, during the early years, and really throughout her years in Ecuador, was an absence of fear. For an article in the Bristol Herald Courier, dated April 8, 1970, reporter asked Peek if she'd ever been afraid for her life living among the Waodani. No, she responded, not in the way someone is frightened in America for their life. She was kind of thinking about the streets of New York City or whatever. Uh, it was true she conceded that the Waodani could be a violent and brutal people. But, but she said, since they've learned about Christians and the right way to live, they're trying to accept this as their way too. Catherine and Rosie had no locks on their doors or windows in their house. The doors propped shut each night with a hunk of petrified wood they found in the river. And Yoey, Dewey, one of the original killers and later a faithful Christian, lived with his family at the other end of the grass airstrip, and he kept an eye on them just to make sure everything was all right. Trust in God's protection wasn't something Catherine wrote much about in her letters, but it was a bedrock assumption of her life. Do you think you and Rosie can handle the situation out there? Asked John Lidskug, the director of SIL in Ecuador, as Peek and Jung prepared to spend much of the next year, 1971, alone in Tueno. Well, certainly not, Joan, or John, excuse me, certainly not, John, Peek replied, but I trust the Lord can, with or without us, and even in spite of us. So Catherine Peek reminds me that whatever the situation, the Lord can handle it with us, or without us, or even in spite of us. The same unassuming trust characterized Peek's attitude towards God's guidance in her life. When she arrived in Ecuador in 1953, she had no idea that she might work one day as a linguist among the Waodani. Several of the more well-known participants in the mission, Jim Elliott, Elizabeth Elliott, Rachel Saint, all expressed a direct sense of calling. Rachel Saint said, these are, God's these are the people God has for me. Catherine's sense of calling was different. It was much more vocational. God had called her to be a linguist to translate the Bible for people who did not have it. It seems that God called Catherine Peake by giving her an intense curiosity about languages and about their marvelously diverse structures. As I mentioned, Peake's first exposure to Out Today, though, which is the people's speech, became, became a central focus of her life in her later missionary service, but her first, her first exposure came on the Hacienda with Rachel. And it would be nearly a quarter of a century, 24 years, between the time in 1955 when she first heard the Wow language and the year 1979 when SIL officially assigned her to translate the New Testament into Wow today, though. So it's 24 years between hearing this language and being assigned to translate the Bible. She was doing other things. Still, she seemed to have a remarkable degree of patience and confidence that God would accomplish his purposes in her life, including Bible translation. Certainly, she experienced moments of stress and tension, but overall, overall, her life was characterized by an attitude of unobtrusive trust. A letter she wrote friends in 1989 offers another illustration. Catherine was updating friends on what was happening among the Wairani. I think I've got one of the compasses. Yeah. And she wrote, well, she wrote about a young wild man who had stopped by the home where she and Rosie lived. His two younger brothers had gotten involved in controversies surrounding a literacy campaign, and by doing so had alienated other Waurani. Peek wrote, quote, after a little visit during which she was enjoying Time magazine, which means he was just leafing through it, uh, she, he suddenly said, I want you two to pray for my two brothers. They don't know what, who they're going to marry or what they're going to do, nor can they get Waurani wives, for their mothers are all refusing to give them their daughters. So they're being pushed to marry outsiders, and we don't want that. It just means the encroachment of outsiders and the loss of our territory. My parents are grieving heavily over this. After he'd gone, Catherine went on to comment, this was all such an unaccustomed outpouring that we were amazed. It was the first time we could remember that any of the Waodani had ever come to us with a specific prayer request. This happened in 1989. Rosie and Catherine both had lived among the Waodani in Tuano, off and on for about 20 years at that point. People prayed in church, a few families would pray together, but until that day, no one had sought out the two of them to ask for a specific prayer. Their work hadn't been rewarded by conventional measures, but their response, in this case, both Catherine's and Rosie's, reflects the confidence in God so characteristic of Catherine Peake's life. They were amazed. 
These, these stories have all centered around what I called Catherine's unobtrusive trust in God for identity, for protection, for guidance, for patience. And it's the foundation for everything else. It was unobtrusive because she didn't talk about it much. She just did it. Staying in touch with Catherine Peake and learning from her as a missionary also involves looking at her, at her relationship with the Waurani. Her words and actions demonstrated a genuine respect and affection without romanticizing or idealizing them. She told me about the months she spent in the 1960s and early 1970s as a passenger in a small plane trying to locate wow clearings hidden in the rainforest. She was accompanied by two or three Wairani who were using loudspeakers to call out from the plane to invite the people below to come to Tuano. She said, I was so charmed by those little figures down in the clearing from the airplane up above. I was so charmed by those little figures down in the clearing. And then they came to Tuano, they weren't so charming, they were people, end quote. People who reflected the traits of their culture, people whose lives were warped by sin, but also people who'd been made in the image of God. Unlike many missionaries, Catherine Peake did not have an attitude of cultural superiority. She carried her southern politeness with her to Ecuador. For example, when Rosie and Catherine lived in Tueno, groups of people would gather around their house in the late afternoon to watch them eat dinner. This was entertainment for the Waurani, but it bothered Catherine to have everybody out circling around the house watching you eat. She, um, she, was, she felt it was impolite to eat in front of them, even though she knew she and Rosie couldn't invite the whole community to dinner every night. Catherine's description of other individual Waurani or their family members also reflected her values. These were not for publication. Instead, they were circulated for prayer to inform people who had visited Tueno and those who were making donations to Waurani Mission. Catherine was both charitable and honest. Um, let's see, the next one. I think, for example, here's what she wrote about Dewey, Dewey and his wife Oba, who were among the first Waurani to profess faith. And I like this phrase. She said, there have never existed more faithful followers according to their light. So that's, a char that's a wonderful charitable way to describe faith in the context of people who don't have much background. According to their light. They've raised a fine family. You always faithfully lengthened and maintained the airstrip, done lots of things. And then, then in the end, she does get a little bit more realistic. He speaks up for the Lord on every occasion, but he's somewhat impervious to what teaching he might receive from other people. And so there's nothing, rather, nothing new to say. We have the impression he's turned people off by adopting a rather pharisaical attitude regarding his own faith and good deeds. I'm going to skip a little bit on here because I know that you guys are going to want your donuts on time. And um, skip to Manti here. One of the concerns had about focusing this lecture on Catherine Peake as a Protestant saint, small s, is that missionaries are often one category of people we do put on a pedestal. They're the ones who are larger than life, spiritual heroes, the people that face every obstacle, including death itself, with triumphant faith. We admire them, but we think we can never emulate them. Part of the reason I respect Catherine Peake is that she was not that kind of a superwoman missionary. She was aware of her faults and sin, and of her need for God's grace. She also insisted that she followed a great God who overruled human mistakes to bring about good. Let me go on and talk a little bit about Catherine's um, sense of humor as well. Let me see. Trouble is just so much to so much to uh, to share. But I want. Yeah, I just you'll have to come. I'll have to come back and tell you about Catherine playing pool. Oh no, wait, I could, well, I could do that, but. Pool, Catherine didn't spend, all, didn't spend all of her time translating the Bible or defending missionaries. The people I want to stay in touch with as saints are those who don't take themselves too seriously, who have room for humor in their lives. Catherine was that kind of a person. And in a letter to her sister Libba in January 1975, Catherine was in Quito, getting ready for a meeting, um, the annual meeting of the, of the Summer Institute of Linguistics. She was getting a manuscript ready for publication. She was also house sitting. And she had asked, been house, ha, asked to house it, and she would describe their experience to Libba. She said, I entertained myself with a piano at the Moors, one family, with a pool table at the Johnsons, the other. The only hitch was that along about 10.30, the lady from downstairs called on the phone and asked me to get, to get quiet, because they could not sleep. I couldn't imagine that the Johnsons boys are all that quiet, but then I got to thinking, here I was running from one end of the pool table to the other on account of I was the only team, and I had shoes that tapped the floor. And the next time I made it a point to wear soft-soled shoes, and the Allens and went and play, we went and played and we quit kind of earlier. And then end with, a, well, end almost, with a, with a helicopter rescue. In, in March 1969, Catherine participated in a dramatic rescue effort. Dabo, a wild man who had come to Tiwano, 
In June 1968, it moved with his extended family some distance north of the community to establish a new living site. March 1969, when oil workers were set to enter the area, Rachel St. sent word that Dabo and his group needed to leave. But he was seriously ill with influenza and they didn't think he'd be able to get out. There was a thought that he might even die. And so a couple of pilots uh, who were working with the oil companies, Texaco, uh, volunteered to mount a rescue effort. So Catherine went along and another SIL person went along. And they managed a very harrowing descent of this helicopter where Catherine had to jump out from the helicopter onto the sand to tell people they had to clear more area for the helicopter to land. She wasn't exactly excited about jumping from this helicopter, but I guess the guy did a good job of getting her close to the ground. So she managed to do it. And it was raining and they brought these people and they loaded them in and it was just a, it was a really tough uh, job. But it was also, everybody got totally soaked. And so then they landed a short time later on the sunny airstrip in Tueno where the sick Wardani could get antibiotics and care. It was a public relations coup for the pilots who now had 200 new Alka friends and photographs were taken to record the adventure. Rachel Saint later expressed concern that the photographs might not be tasteful if the Wairani girls' dresses were dripping wet and clinging, clinging to their bodies after being out in the rain. No problem there, Pika assured her, the girls weren't wearing clothes. <laughs> And uh, another kind of humor reflects the familiarity of long-term relationships, teasing among people who know each other well. Uh, in this instance, Rosie Young made a passing remark and Catherine told the story of what happened. Um, in 1992, they, were in, they had gone back to Tueno to give classes on uh, how to study the Bible and they were finishing the final class before they were going back to the States. And they got to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John where it says, and this is an English version of the Wairani translation. Quote, seeing Jesus come, people who lived there prepared a fiesta for him, saying, we look well on Jesus. Just, you know, saying, Jesus is a good guy. The next, and Rosie threw in a facetious remark, saying, nobody ever does that for us. The next day we were told, don't cook your lunch. Fine with us, too busy packing. Uh, after the school kids had eaten, the Wairani women uh, escorted us up to the school kitchen where Anna had, with some helpers, whomped up the most delicious stew for all the adults. And in our honor, Anna's husband had been on a hunting trip bringing back a huge wild boar while Anna smoked and still had it on hand. She also had banana drink for all. It was an even better feast than they had fed us for the New Testament dedication. And it touched us even more. Pete concluded by quoting two verses from the Wairani New Testament. Uh, and the Wairani use the word drink instead of eat because they, they, their main food stuff is maniac that's, that's kind of a thick drink. And um, she says, she quoted Matthew 8, 11, even so, listen to what I'm saying. When our deceased grandparents, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come and drink well at the king of heaven's fiesta, behold, those who live in the sunrise and those who live toward the sunset, even though they are not Israelites, will come and drink together with their grandfathers. And in Revelation 19, 9, it will be great joy for those who are invited and come. Let's come and drink the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. Okay, one last, let's go on, skip down to, um, to Catherine and Oba. There's a picture towards the end there. Um, one final, one of the most important things in keeping in touch with Catherine Peake by reading and rereading her hundreds of pages of letters and reports is to remind me that sometimes with no fanfare, the secret to good missions is that missionaries and indigenous people simply become friends and love each other. They will know we are Christians by our love. In part, that's what the fiesta was all about. Uh, in part two, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a, a story of the way that Catherine and one of her dear friends uh, related to one another. And it's the center of this next final story of how the way of holy life like Catherine's Peaks can express Christian faith in the context of the Amazon rainforest. This features another poem that Catherine wrote. Yeah, and um, it's, it's really just sort of a rough, rough draft. But the main part about it is Oba, this friend of hers, was so upset when Catherine left uh, after they'd finished the Bible translation that she couldn't come to the airplane to say goodbye. Uh, and then later, Catherine found out that Oba had died of a ch chickenpox epidemic, and Catherine was totally distraught. And she writes this poem, and the thing that touched me about it was that, that at the end, she, she kind of says, oh Lord, I should have gone first. And then she goes back and being a good, good Presbyterian, she says, what self-conceit, as if I knew God's cosmology. But I thought of the, the verse, no greater love than this, to lay one, down one's life for one's friends. Catherine loved Oba, and Oba loved Catherine. And when I told one of the SIL people that I was gonna show the picture, she said, oh, I'm so glad you're gonna show Oba and Catherine together. But that's sometimes at the heart of missions and the heart of the kind of people we wanna to get to know. And so I'll stop there and thank you for your patience. Tonight at seven at First Presbyterian, join us in Tadlock if you'd like. Thank you for being here.